The southwest of England has a rich tradition of food and farming, with food and drink businesses growing and processing high quality desirable products, often using traditional, small scale, low tech methods with respect for the local environment. But all businesses are facing a challenge when it comes to growth. In order to cut costs and increase efficiency, they become potentially wasteful of resources, like raw materials, energy and water. Some older practices risk being lost as businesses expand, and there are other challenges. Cornwall is a very poor county, I think it's the poorest county in, in England and the second poorest region in Northern Europe. So we have a lot of challenges around income and providing services to the population. When you're talking about um, the food service industry in the southwest, you know, you're talking about the southwest experience. Um, people come here for uh, an experience, people come here for quality. The issue is economic inequality actually. It's highly seasonal, it's highly precarious. They may also become more vulnerable to external factors. These might include damaging climate change, unpredictable fluctuations in global resource markets and other shocks. A team of researchers at the University of Exeter, including business experts, systems modelers and environmental scientists, has been working with small and medium-sized food companies on how they might adopt circular economy principles. A possible solution might be the idea of the circular economy. It's about designing new ways of doing things that are restorative and regenerative of natural resources and the wider ecosystem. But what is the circular economy? And how can it help these companies? What it means is, to me personally, is to see how we can get more of the inputs cycling around the system rather than things going in a linear fashion and really to see how we can work with our supply base and our customers to see what we can do, you know, how we can work with that. For me, the circular economy means that we need to balance economic, social and environmental factors in a new way, where we don't just try to balance these things at company level, but at wider systems level. Well, the circular economy for me is this vision of a regenerative system. It's far more than just thinking about waste reduction. I think first and foremost, it has to be that we must value every piece of resource that we have. If you asked me that question 10 years ago, the circular economy would be around buying local. And I think that's probably most people's starting point. If you ask me that question today, it's, I think, taken on a whole different dimension in terms of the life cycle of the products and the decisions that you make in your business or as a consumer. So thinking much, much more around where's the energy coming from, where's the money ending up, what waste can we reuse, or, well, the first thing to do is reduce what you're using or what you're wasting, and then find another use for what's left at the end of it. The mistake of many firms has been to sort of nibble away at the edges where in the future it's quite clear we're going to have to redesign the process, we're going to have to capture value and nutrients and waste and heat, all of which has been uh, left to one side. To me, based on my water engineering background, circular economy is linked to the recovery and reuse of resources along three pathways along the water pathway, the energy pathway, and the material or nutrient pathway. It's a, a holistic level of thinking. And in order to achieve this, what we also need is to think about the, uh, the constituent parts of the system that we call about. Moving away from the, the kind of linear processes we have at the moment where you know, we build something, we use it and then we chuck it away basically, to a system that mimics more natural processes where you get growth, decline, decay, regeneration. So it's about thinking of things that rather than there being waste products, maybe they're an input to somebody else's business, 
So it's about businesses working together more, more collaboration, getting benefits of economies of scale, and really it's a stepping stone to being more sustainable and more resilient. How can you use the circular economy to address that, to address food waste, to address economic inequality and to address our impact on the environment? If you can stitch all that together, I think that's the promise of the circular economy. The research team engaged with nine dairy and bakery processors across the southwest of England. Some were very small farm-based businesses, others were medium-sized factory type operations. The aim was to understand how the businesses operated at the moment. What was the current state? Where were the processes too linear? Where were the opportunities to adopt circular principles in order to achieve business growth while continuing to respect the planet and people? Physical commodities don't just spring out of nowhere, you know, they have a, a trail of, of, of waste, of, uh, you know, resources that have to go into them to produce them and manufacture them. So as a social enterprise brewery, we of course had to tackle that. And that's when we started having conversations with Exeter University. We think the greatest kind of untapped opportunity is with the small and medium sized enterprises. In fact, they comprise the vast majority of the British food and drink industry. So we really wanted to target SMEs. Luckily, in the southwest of England, in Devon, Cornwall, Dorset, Somerset, there's a lot of SMEs, food and drink producers. We were quite spoilt for choice, really. So there were just so many great businesses out there that really wanted to engage with us. It's very important for us as academics to be on the ground, working with a whole range of stakeholders, companies, policymakers. NGOs, civil society actors of various types. Because, you know, you can sit in your office, in your labs all day long, developing exciting theories, but if they don't have any relevance to, what we, you know, the real world, then, you know, it's, it's no good. So, you know, throughout my career, I've always been very keen to engage with all sets of stakeholders, all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life to not just communicate what I've come up with to them, but engage in what is sometimes called the co-production of knowledge. Working with small businesses is quite challenging because they're very busy um, and we're trying to encourage them to take part in research, but they're busy trying to do their job and run their business. So just working out some of those logistics are, are really quite difficult. Um, we also learned that they're really interested in the environment and in circular economy, but there are real challenges in adopting some of the technologies, some of the practices. So we, we basically learned that there's a need for this kind of research and then to translate it into practical action. Cornwall is on the edge of the pond, so to speak, um, and it's, it's a considerable distance from its key markets. So uh, materials have to be brought into Cornwall, which adds extra cost. All our finished product has to be taken out of Cornwall uh, to reach those markets, so that's extra cost. Yeah, like I said, we actually use 5,000 litres a day just for cooling some churns. We have got a borehole which we can use for some of the jobs, but we can't use it for all. Our main usage is gas to run our boilers, because without steam, I, I can't make any of the cheese without, without steam at all. The ice cream manufacturing is an energy intensive business. So we have used uh, building roofs and also some of the land of the farm to put solar panels on, which are generating electricity to help with the generation of the ice cream. That's something that needs much more work, it's not complete by any means. The Exeter team constructed models of how energy, water, materials and other resources were currently flowing within businesses. And these current state models were developed into computer simulations. The process starts with visiting the companies first and understanding their process flow. So for example, if it is a dairy farm, we go and look at, for example, the milking parlour, uh, the processes associated with the production of milk and ice cream, if that is the case. The point of a current state map is to capture the process, flows, materials and stakeholders in any type of system. The way we did that here, we had a portable mapping system which I carried and using post-it notes and pens we drew with the various firms their particular flow of suppliers, processes and materials. 
Having created the current state map, we then found where the bottlenecks were, and from there we could spot where the hotspot areas where we could zoom in and improve. The computer model then uses this data from their system, the processes, and then runs some experiments to show them that what is achievable. So it is a way of you know, experimenting before implementing a decision. System dynamics modeling or systems thinking is a methodology, an approach for simulating complexity and complex systems where direct analytic process doesn't exist or is very hard to find. It works by building the whole model along feedback loops, where one component interacts with the other and we have feedback from this interaction. So it was very appropriate to use it for the dairy farms in order to have the feedback on the whole system by the water or energy or nutrient reuse. The researchers created new simulations of possible future states with new closed loops of resource flows within businesses or exchange of resources with external partners. So when we came to thinking how could we help firms in a practical sense, we came up with the idea of the circular economy maturity model. The idea here is that we're not just thinking about waste elimination and gradual improvement. Here the emphasis is on restoring value to the whole system. And there are four steps, if you like. The linear production systems of the 20th century are very much running already, so there's no need to have an emphasis on throughput. Now we're thinking about, on the first step, it's firm value and the three R's, reducing, reusing and recycling. And as firms step up a gear, they start to think about value across the supply chain. So they start to connect with customers, suppliers and distributors. On the third level, it's all about governance value. Here, our firms will be helping to shape policy. They'll be sharing ideas for circular products and services across the sector and non-governmental organisations may start to get involved. At the highest level, step four, it's about the whole ecosystem. And by this we mean that the whole region is now involved, working across the supply chain with consumers and policy makers. There may even be a regional hub where knowledge can be exchanged between firms. This is the highest level. It involves natural capital, the idea of ecosystem services. Here, by firms working together, they're creating resilience across the region and across the sector. So this is the highest level of circular economy maturity. So this is one of the key outputs of this project. This is our circular economy model for clean growth. This model provides us with possible scenarios for what happens if energy prices uh, begin to rise, for example, what happens if water prices rise, or materials, what happens if there's an issue with labour costs after Brexit. And so all of these scenarios now begin to feed into ideas for working more efficiently, more effectively, but above all in a system that's more resilient but there is already plenty of circular practice going on. For walking around the sites of some of these businesses, we saw some excellent practices. We saw the anaerobic digester plants being used, which uh, recaptures value. We also saw heat exchanges being used, which can capture the energy generated from some of the production processes. We also saw solid fuel burners being installed, and this can reuse some of the solids which might otherwise be lost. Already, the collaboration between the Exeter research team and regional businesses seems to be paying off. We've kind of helped a bakery set up a, a new kind of symbiosis with a brewery in the same city, whereby the brewery will take some of that surplus bread to make their own special bread beer. So uh, that's been a really exciting sort of development that's happened during this research project. From both an economic point of view, uh, a competitive point of view, and a resource point of view, we have to be as absolutely as efficient as we can. There are a number of little byproducts that, since we started talking with the University of Exeter, things like whey and buttermilk, 
we found customers for those. We need to be farming in such a way as to be growing crops for the cows to eat. You know, we want to be as sustainable as we can. The thought process is that I think I just was just a beginning in me two years ago when we first got in touch. Those thought processes have really been developing and are, I think, going to guide how this business is going to develop into the future. In conclusion, there are a number of learning points from the project. The first is that business benefits from circular economy. Our research finds that adopting the circular economy approach offers a range of benefits to firms in the agri-food sector, from the minimization of waste to the recapture of value across materials, energy and water use. So when firms start to work together as part of our wider regional ecosystem, this offers greater business resilience against shocks to the system, such as shortages, drought and rising prices. The second point is around firm integration and circular economy adoption. Although many companies we worked with are very small, it is not size, but the integrated nature of the business in relation to the wider environment which often determines ease of becoming circular. For example, some firms can produce ice cream on the same site as their farm. It's much easier to close loops for them than others who do not have direct access to fields where they could, for example, put their wastewater and make use of these nutrients. The third point, location matters. All of our SMEs on the project are very much embedded in the social, cultural, economic and ecosystem fabric of not just the South West, but their own very specific location. These are very place-specific companies producing place-specific products that can only be produced in this way in this location. Being based at the periphery is also of importance. For example, it can be very costly and time-consuming to transport things in and out of Cornwall. The circular economy then takes this into account and is a tool to valorise local resource streams and making the most out of what you have available in your locality. The fourth point is about economies of scope. When you are small and located in a peripheral region, then circular economy thinking helps you to cooperate with different stakeholders, supply partners, policy makers, even competitors. Our governance value level in the maturity model is all about this, where one can increase the scope of SMEs through collaboration. The fifth point is around system effectiveness. Yes, one can increase resource efficiency massively at firm level, and we have done that by working with the companies directly, but we can't stay at firm level. We need to move to a wider systems perspective, which the circular economy encourages. Circular economy, then, is concerned with the effectiveness of the wider system at social, economic and ecosystem level. Finally, policy innovation and support. If the effectiveness of the wider system is the target, then businesses on their own can't achieve that. They need to cooperate, but also talk to policymakers whose job it is to have a wider regional systems perspective. They need to take a helicopter view and try to coordinate these resource loops and cooperation across sectors. If done correctly, a circular economy approach can really help regional economic development as it helps to grow regional economies by keeping value in the region. In summary, circular economy offers long-term benefits for regions such as the South West in addressing waste, value recapture and business resilience. While the team found that some good practice already exists in the form of closed farm systems and redistribution of food surpluses, there is considerably more work to be done in terms of achieving circular economy maturity as part of an interconnected regional system. In the future, they hope that circular thinking will stimulate new opportunities post-Brexit, with sharing of good practice taking place and helped by local government support for new initiatives such as knowledge hubs.